All right, good morning. Colonel Edward Shames was born in Norfolk, Virginia, and was in Naval School in the United States entered World War II. He volunteered for the paratroopers in September 1942 and was assigned to I Company 3rd Battalion of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne Division. James then became first sergeant of headquarters company, and after receiving a battlefield commission to second lieutenant, he became platoon leader for third platoon, Easy Company, now known as Band of Brothers. He's the last living officer from Easy Company, and it's my honor to present Colonel James. I don't want to say good evening, good night, or what? Our lecture this morning is, will be, World War II. Normandy, Holland, Bastogne, or as some would know it as, D-Day, Market Garden, Battle of the Bulge. Most historians would say that these battles just about summed up the victory of our World War II battles in Europe. I have no idea. But I was in each of these battles big time and survived to be here and tell my take. Mr. Roberts, the big boss of all of us here in this hall called me two years ago and said you're on for 25 minutes to lecture such a group as this, to tell them how you jumped into Normandy and fought our way to the eagle's nest in Bavaria to end the war in Europe. You never say no to Mr. Roberts, but I thought this guy is a bit nuts to think I could cover a campaign that took us 11 months to accomplish back in 1944 in 25 minutes. Looks like I'm gonna have to do it in 20 minutes tonight. <laughs> well, I'm back this time with twice as much time as I had, I thought, last time I tried it. But let's go. By the way, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be with you here again. As you all know, I'm older than dirt, <laughs> pushing hell out of my 97th birthday. No, no, no big deal. I'm delighted to be with you today. Let's face it, at my age, I'm delighted to be anywhere and know where I am. <laughs> Now let's go to war. <laughs> My parachute infantry regiment unit was an experimental parachute regiment, started as something new to the Army, as we were made up of only recruits from civilian life with no prior military service. We to be with the 506 parachute infantry regiment and I will blow my own horn a bit. It was one of the finest units there's ever been in our history. Not by accident, but by design. And I must add, the training almost killed all of us, but 2,500 came out to form a regiment to initially do the job out of 7,000 recruits to join. The only army that began with us were highly selected non-coms as our cadre and senior officers, company grade officers were from OCS or other military units and academies also highly selected. We were supposed to be the thing. We thought so anyhow. 7,000 men were in the pool to be whittled down to 2,500 or regimental strength at that time. The competition was tough. How I survived it, I don't know, but I did make it. 
Our unique training was to make super soldiers out of all of us. Our tactics is a topic in itself. Later, not now. We finished our basic initial training at Camp Tacoa, Georgia. Finished our advanced phase at brand new facility named Camp McCall, originally part of Fort Bragg. The Army did not want us to be available for anything, and Fort Bragg didn't want us there. So instead of being part of Fort Bragg, they knew we were going to fail. So instead of they cut a piece out of Fort Bragg and named it Camp McCall. Now, how childish can you get? But that was the U.S. Army at that time. And I'm not kidding. We killed half of the regular army at the Tennessee Maneuvers and was told to get the hell out of there and get on a ship going to England. We were tough. We were made tough, made that way. The last thing that we did going to Fort Benning for our jump training was to walk 149 miles in three days with everything that we could carry, including all of our weapons, extra ammunition, including a couple of extra rounds of mortar shell so we could feed the mortars. We had no supply. We were the supply. And it was tough. We arrived at England in September 1943. Worked like hell preparing for the jump into Normandy, June the 5th, 1944. I had become a member of my battalion staff as the operations sergeant and had supervised the construction of the sand tables for our battalion jump on D-Day. I do my stuff, I worked hard at it. And incidentally, I'll let you all know, in order to get ahead, you've got to work like hell and don't think it's gonna come easy. If you want it bad enough, you can do it. But you've got to want it, and I did. Because of my job, I knew what I was supposed to do, know every step of my business, and the battalion's mission and objective. I did, but the pilots of our C-47 the night of June the 5th did what 75% of all the rest of them did when they hit the coast of France. They scattered like hell and scared the hell out of them, and I can understand it. They ducked for cover. Consequently, some of the planes dropped men as much as 50 miles away from their initial drop zone. What could have been a disaster of untold magnitude turned out to be to our advantage. The drop was so vast in area, the Germans high command warned their army units that as many as 200,000, 200,000 crazy paratroopers had dropped that night. Actually, there were 30,000 total. It scared the hell out of them so badly that they just gave up and yelled, Comrade, the moment they confronted the butchers with big pockets. Our jumpsuits had big pockets for all of our equipment and material. Normally, S3 operations sergeant jumped with the battalion. But because the Army wanted the press to be with the commander of the battalion, the <clears throat> the plane going to France, I was shunted to the last minute to another plane. I have no idea. I was so nervous at that time. And everyone had said that they were calm that night, was either as crazy as hell or a liar. <laughs> nervous and shaking as well as all the rest of them at that moment. I have no idea where they carried me, which plane they put me on. I had no idea because I was on no manifest whatsoever, have never been on a manifest because I was taken off the manifesto that I was playing beyond. To this day, no one can actually find me on any manifest. I, can e I can't even prove that I actually jumped into Normandy, but I swear to you, I was there. 
The jump master knew me and told me to get behind the last man and stick. And when the green light comes on, start pushing like hell to have everyone clear the plane as quickly as possible. Each one of us had as much as 70 pounds to 90 pounds worth of stuff on us besides our chutes, which of course we left behind on the plane. All we needed to help, we need all the help we could get to get on our feet to, hit, to hitch up to the static line. The man in front of me at that moment of the green light slipped to the floor just as he reached the exit door. Before I was able to get him up, we were a good ways from the others on our plane. I jumped into a 4th of July final parachute, I mean, uh, final parish, uh, uh, fireworks display. As you remember, if you've been to these parks, at the last moment they fired everything they had, and that's what it looked like when I jumped out of that plane. You could hear, and you could actually never forget the noise that that stuff and the bullets coming through your chute coming down from that jump. Seconds seemed as minutes until the ground hit you into the face. Only this wasn't the ground that I landed on. I landed on a bunch of cows, C-O-W-S. <laughs> they were in a holding pen for the Carnation Milk Factory in Carentan, France. Because of all the turmoil and noise, the cows were mooing like crazy. It didn't take me just but a few seconds to think that that was a damn good idea, and I start mooing too. <laughs> Something must have worked as I was out of there in a flash, but I had no idea where I was. If I had known then what I know now, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Why? Because I would have dropped dead right there because on my sand tables, I had a sign on the church steeple of Carrington, avoid at all cost. There are two armor corps stationed at Carrington, and there I was right in the middle of it. I did not know that. Like I said, had I known that, I would have dropped dead right then. I used all the skill I've ever learned as a kid with maps, and I had better train to do. I figured out where I was and where I had to go. Of course, after all, I was the operations sergeant, and I did know what I was doing. On the way, I picked up 18 men, completely lost, and we all arrived at our bridge, our bridge defensive area at 4 a.m., 6 o'clock, 6, 4 a.m., 6 of June, 1944. There were only about 120 people from our entire battalion there. It was supposed to be close to 600. But we held for three days. We held those bridges for three days and the division found us we called the Lost Battalion. We had no communication with anyone for three days. The invasion of the beaches were four miles away. Started at 0600 that morning, Utah Beach. I was also informed that I was to receive a battlefield commission at that time at 4 a.m. on June the 6th. Wow, what a morning. On the evening of 11th of June, the battalion was ordered to run the Germans out of Carentan, where the armored divisions were located, at the beginning of 4 a.m. in the morning, which we did not know at that same time at 4 a.m. Germans had come down from Calais area, where they expected the invasion to start. They had time to reach that area 
at 12th of June. And they were to jump off at 4 a.m. to push us back out of Carantan, back to the beach, and then push the beach forces back into the water. We succeeded to do what we were supposed to do that morning with the help of the 3rd Army Division that came on the beach and into our, our aid about 12 o'clock noon that day. And we prevailed, had we not prevailed, and allowed the Germans to come through us, we would probably still be over there fighting Germans, getting them off the coast of France. The next morning, things were a little different. It was the 13th of June. The enemy had time, as I said, to move a large force of that armor from Calais. And we were to start pushing back even further to give the beach forces room to maneuver. That was the roughest day that I've ever made in war, including Bastogne. How do I remember all of this so well as June 13th? Because June 13th was my birthday. <laughs> I kept thinking, born June 13th, KIA June 13th. <laughs> no joke. I was far from laughing about it at that time. After the Battle of the Bloody Gulch, as it was named, for good reason, we lost a lot of men that day, we left for England, where we prepared for our next mission, Market Garden. The date was the 15th of July. I was formally commissioned while we were in England and was informed that by special permission by the Army, I was to be allowed to remain in the 506 First time for the Army, because that was absolutely a no-no. If you were enlisted in a regiment or division, and you became an officer for some reason or another, OCS or what have you, you were transferred out of the division, let alone the unit that you were in. That was Army regulations. Incidentally, since that time, I've written a book or I had a bit, book written for me in my biography. This is no sale pitch, as I make no money from the sale of this book. This book was number one on the military list for a couple of years. It's still doing well, well. I've never made a dime on this book, never intend to make a dime on it, because all the proceeds that I would get are supposed to go to the Wounded Warriors Fund. Operation Market Garden was a composite force of two airborne divisions of Americans, the 82nd and the 101st Airborne Division. I think the 82nd still exists. I'm just kidding. <laughs> British Airborne Division, the Red Devils, was part of it, a Polish Airborne Division, and various other smaller units from European countries composed of the armies that went in on Market Garden. It was the largest air drop ever. They say you could have walked over the English Channel by stepping on plane and gliders from England to the drop zones in Holland. Time and date of the start of Market Garden was 1,100 hours, 17 September 1944. The fact is drops were being made in Holland while planes were being taken off in England for the same battle. That's how vast an operation it was. Caveat, the British screwed up big time. <laughs> Mistake. The 82nd and 101st fulfilled their missions. The British caused the largest screw up in World War II, a story in itself. You people should know everything there was to know about Marty Garden. It's quite a lesson. No time now, but you should 
Learn all you can about Marky Gordon without fail. My suggestion. The 506 is in Holland for 72 days of contact with the enemy. Some kind of record. We lost a lot of men, but we freed half the Dutch people from brutal German slavery that had lasted for three or more years. Colonel Sink designated me as a regimental platoon, patrol platoon leader and assigned me to 3rd Platoon E Company after I was commissioned as the regimental platoon for the regiment. When we were talking, I reminded him that naming me as a platoon leader, platoon leader, when 90% of the assistant platoon leaders were already first lieutenants, would cause some problems in the ranks. His answer was, and I still have it ringing in my ears, when I needed some advice from some half-assed second lieutenant, I would call on you, and as far as an assistant platoon leader, I thought it over and can't think of an officer that I have in this command that would last two days with you because you're too nasty. <laughs> now get your ass out of here and go to work to your job. I expect to work like hell. And welcome to the new job. One of my first missions was rescuing, rescuing 150 English paratroopers from across the Rhine, hidden by the Dutch underground. They were left over from the fiasco that they caught themselves in. We went across in canvas boats, canvas boats, fold-up boats, furnished by the Brits. When we were briefed on a mission, I thought it was a suicide job. We rescued all the people, including two American flyers, who were rescued by the Dutch underground that had waited until an opportunity came to have them on our side again. At the briefing, some brigadier general, British brigadier general, told us that they had developed this scheme with these canvas boats manned by our men, E Company men, and four non-coms to be the leaders of this rescue squad. After the briefing, he wanted to know if there were any questions. Being an enlisted man not too long ago, I jumped up, and my battalion commander said, what the hell are you going to ask him? And I ignored him completely, because he was the guy that I caught running the wrong way at the Bloody Gulch when I grabbed his arm and said, sir, the fighting is that way. <laughs> he did not name me as his S3 or assistant S3, Colonel Sink did. He would have nothing to do with me, and I would have nothing to do with him. How he got to be battalion commander, I have no idea. None of my business. <laughs> the brigadier said, Lieutenant, are you volunteering for this mission? I said, no, sir. I don't volunteer for anything. <laughs> that brought a big laugh out of the group. There was about 100 of them in there. I said, I didn't see a damn thing funny, but before I allow my men to go, I would go. So sure enough, the next morning, I found myself with two of my other platoon leaders from E Company joining me, leading those boats, and you know they love me to death, <laughs> if you understand what I mean. After 72 rough combat days in Holland, we were sent to Strategic Reserve to wait out for the winter for the spring offensive at a place in Champagne district of France. We were 12, mile, 12 miles from Champagne capital of France called Reims, Lens as they're called, and 90 miles from heaven 
a place called Paris. You've heard of that, to die for. I had not, I had personally not had leave since April because of being promoted in my battlefield commission <clears throat> and had not had a full paycheck since then because of the same reason. Man, I was sailing when I was told I would be one of the first to leave for Marmalon to go to Paris. I had tailor-made officer uniform that shone on me like a clown, but very prideful. I had not worn it. We came to Marmalon about the end of November, and the bulletin came out with a leave list. On top of the leave list was Lieutenant Edward Shames, convoy commander, for two trucks, convoy commander. Cham case of champagne for each truck, 15 men in trucks going to Paris for 48 hours. We leave at 0700, get the date, 17 December 1944. Forgot to tell you, we could get all the champagne we could drink for 50 cents a bottle because the cigarettes cost us 50 cents a carton. And for a carton of cigarettes, you could get six or eight bottles of champagne. And we didn't want to waste it, we drank it. <laughs> the night before we were to leave for Paris, the radio kept the bulletin on the air about an enemy breakthrough in the Ardennes about 150 miles to our north. We thought it was tough, but we thought for the news unit online to wait to, to thaw, but we had other things to think about. Paris. The morning of the 17th, we were waiting for our trucks loaded at 0700, and away we went. We had about 15 or 20 bottles of champagne in each truck to ease the ride to Paris. About 30 minutes in our ride that morning, the driver said to me, the shoot patrol, shoot patrol, were, they were our MPs. The driver was telling me to pull over. And they used to pull a lot of tricks on me because I was new, a new officer. And I said, the hell with that. I said, keep going. We're on our way to Paris. He said, sir, the driver on a motorcycle is a captain. I said, better pull over. <laughs> I jumped out and was told that we were to get back to post haste Post haste, we were loading trucks at that moment, headed north as soon as possible. We were red alerted. We got to our camp. We were told to put on our combat uniform off over our class A's. We did not have time to change. Grab what you could. Get on open-sided track to trailer trucks. We are heading north now. That was the beginning of the battle for Bastogne. We arrived at, at Marmalon. Our clothing and equipment was in sorry shape for 72 rough days in combat. Was told to turn in our stuff to receive it, to get it repaired or receive new equipment. On the 17th of December, all we had was light stuff from Normandy and in the way most of us were equipped. Most, not all of us, had at least a light leather jacket. No warm footwear was available because it didn't exist in that time. We were waiting for the spring thaw. The night of that ride to where we did not know until we stopped and saw a bent sign on the side of the road that indicated we were entering a village named Bastone which meant absolutely nothing to all of us. We started to unload our flatbed truck. We were almost froze to death during the night trip there. We had no roof on the truck, 
and they were not solid sides. They were just, uh, what do you call them? Come on, give me a name. Trucks, sides. It was cold, foggy. You could hardly see 500 feet ahead when we offloaded. When the fog lifted just a little bit, we noticed that coming down the road in front of our trucks were thousands, not hundreds, but thousands of our military people, American troops, officers, and men running down the road, yelling, get back, get back, the Germans are coming, they're going to kill all of us. I was never more ashamed of our American army in my life than at that moment. They were throwing their weapons to the side of the road, which we were glad to have. They were keeping their coats, but some of me was throwing some of their coats away, which we were also glad to have because it was cold. It was so cold and foggy you could see five you couldn't see five hundred feet ahead. It was a sight that I hope I would forget. I never want to see that again. Thousands of our men running away from the enemy. They were new troops, true. But I couldn't figure it. Moments later, a jeep came rolling down the road in back of us stopped at our position, and I noticed it was Colonel Sink, his S3 officer, and my battalion commander in that jeep. He drove right to our platoon. Colonel Sink stepped from the jeep, came to me, and ordered me to have a patrol to continue up that road where these people came from to make a contact with some enemy or whatever we could find. I told my platoon sergeant to have six men ready to go with me, find what we were up against. They were well trained. I had trained them to the utmost degree. The seven of us followed the ditch, the ditch leading to the woods for about 10 minutes. We were alerted by sounds. In the dark, in the fog, you always heard sounds of some kind. One of my men said he saw something that looked like a haystack. Popeye Wynn, one of my scouts, who was always good for a smile on any occasion, said that they were the funniest haystacks he ever did see. He saw them move. A moment later, the fog lifted. And we were just 200 yards from 18 German tanks, Pans uh, not Panzer tanks, but Panther tanks, apparently waiting for the snow and fog to clear. I whisked to my men to get the hell out of there quietly but hastily, which we did. We reported to Colonel Sink what we saw. He immediately had the regiment set up for a defensive line on the road and we know it was an avenue of approach to the town of Bastogne, which was the key to seven road nets. The Germans had to had those no, the roads because of their armor to continue on to ob their objective, Antwerp, where we had a large supply center after we left Normandy. The entire 101st Division circled by stone like a wagon wheel, the hub of the wheel being by stone. The spokes were various units of the division. We had about 11,000 men defending the town. The German army had about 100,000 plus ready to move if only Bastogne was not in their way. I'm sure you've all read the story of Bastogne. The highway through the village of Foy, Foy called, 
leading to Bastogne was the main road, and that was where the third platoon, my platoon, had its headquarters foxhole. Our small area was on a hill overlooking the village of Foix. We were there for 29 straight days of 17 degree temperature below zero. For five of the first days, the entire 101st Airborne Division was completely surrounded by German forces. The breakthrough came by Patton breaking through one of the areas when we were relieved at that time. We were not rescued because at that time we had also gone as little offensive as we could. We had no depth because we had to stay close to our source, which was Bastogne. You can understand that with only 11,000 men. It was a joke during those five days. The Croats have us surrounded, the poor bastards. <laughs> we were limited because of sheer numbers, so we had to limit our engagements with the Germans. We knew that they had to come in and keep rolling to keep those armored people moving. And we would always suck them in to our perimeter, close them off with their men. The men was following their armor. We knock off the men and then knock off the armor by hitting them in the rear with bazookas. The road into Bastogne was a little field with knocked out tanks and frozen crowds. Most of the patrol platoon's job was night patrolling and keeping an eye out for Germans in American uniforms. We were warned that there were hundreds of them that had lived and schooled in the States before the war to do just what they were doing right now, infiltrating our lines. We were told from regiment that an American was using a well to fill canteens at night at an abandoned farmhouse in no man's land. We had a man on an OP observe that it was a kraut that filled those canteens of water and walked back to enemy territory, and that taught us. Therefore, we knew he was a kraut in an American uniform. We laid a pickup on him the next night, got the info we needed where nine of the bastards were holed up. The next night, seven of my men paid them a visit, walked back to our headquarters, foxhole, with all of them in tow. All of them spoke English as we did, but we knew not to talk while we were returning back to our lines because they understood everything we would say. I had a Sergeant Stroll, one of the best soldiers in the American Army. He grew up in Fogelsville, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch country, where he spoke German before he knew English and was listening to the Germans talk in German while we were marching back to our foxhole. He heard him mention Malmedy. Does everybody know what Malmedy was? Do not know. That's where the Germans captured about 100 of our men and bound their hands with barbed wire, opened up the back of their trucks with machine guns and killed all of them, all the POWs that they had, murdered them, just when the Ardennes Battle of the Bulge started. These same people that we were bringing back, some of them were in Malmody. They had something to do with that. So we really didn't have much faith in what they said or what they did. We didn't care about them. It appeared some of this group was responsible for the Malmody massacre. By the time we got to our spot in woods, we knew quite a bit about our POWs. We always gave a preliminary interrogation before giving them to regiment, so we knew what was going on. 
That was our job. We wanted to know where the main body of their SS unit was located so as to save a lot of our soldiers. Stroll said that the leader of this group kept telling his men not to tell us anything as we would soon join our dead buddies at Marmody because when we, they finished with us, the Germans were coming in to get us. When I confronted the leader with the fact that Stroll had told us that it had been discussed. That time they thought we knew nothing. That infuriated this leader, and he brought it out to me. Pig, I tell you nothing. And he spit in my face. I didn't like that. When I did, I pulled out my 45 and sent him to heaven. Isn't that a hell of a thing to admit? But I did, and I was very happy about it. <laughs> Two days later, hold it, hold it, hold it. Two days later, the skies opened up, and we were resupplied with everything. We went on to complete our mission to really ruin, our, uh, ruin the Germans. At that resupply, we had to send people out to pick up bundles. I sent out three or four of our people, like all the other battalion squads and platoon. About an hour later, Sergeant McClung, an Indian, full-blooded Indian, came and said, hey, Cap, they call me Cap. And everybody had a nickname. Of course, my nickname actually was the SOB, <laughs> son of the battalion. Don't get that wrong. <laughs> he said, Cap, you have a package. When he said, I had a package, all I can think about was somebody sent me a cap, a hat, a muffler, or a pair of gloves. Of course, the gloves I had, I took off of a crowd that had no fingers. So when he gave me the package, he gave me a package that was about 12 inches long, about an inch and a half square. So I looked at that package, I said, how in the hell do you get a pair of gloves in that package? <laughs> when I opened it up, it was just what I needed in that 14 degree weather, a gold fountain pen. I looked at the pen, had my name on it. I took that pen, I threw it into the snow. About two hours later, Sergeant Stroll, he said, Cap, did you throw this pen away? I said, certainly, if you want to keep it. He said, sir, take a look at that pen. I said, what the hell you want me to look at a pen for? I'm freezing to death. <laughs> had burlap bags for shoes. He said, look at the pen. So I looked at the pen. He said, now look at the engraving on it that the factory put on. 14 carat solid gold. My friend had sent me a gold pen that paid, she paid $145 for that pen. Today it's worth 10000 and I'm not kidding. I have it, it looked just like the day it was solid gold. It looked like the day it came. That was one of my things. Anyhow, I thought you would enjoy that one. <laughs> the rest of the war in Europe was downhill all the way. The 506 were finally tasked to Birch's Garden. The 3rd Platoon was told to lead the way right to the Eagle's Nest, where we were first to loot steal and take anything we wanted and could carry. I had warned my people when I took over the platoon in Holland, do not take anything from these people when we occupy their houses or their possessions. They have enough from the Germans. They had nothing. We don't want to take any more from them. I told them, I promised them, when you get to Germany, you can loot, steal, take, Anything but a 
person's life if he were innocent. If he were not innocent, shoot the bastard. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's late, and I appreciate you listening to me. I had to cut out a little bit of things. I hope you had a slight insight, insight to my World War II tour. God bless you, and God bless America. It was, it was, it, 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 it wasn't that good because I had to leave a lot of stuff out because the guy that came before me, apparently he was a farm guy. He must have been a farmer because it seemed like, and he was a, a he raised bulls, I'm sure, because he was a bull shipper. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Ed, can you stay for a couple of questions? Oh, certainly, if we got time. Sure, we're going to make time. We're going to make time. The man crazy, he wants somebody to ask me a question. Now, well, want to walk. We got time for a couple of questions. May, we can't let this man get off. May, may I warn you, if you ask me a question that I don't know the answer to, I'm going to make up one because you wouldn't know the difference anyhow. <laughs> How you doing, first buddy? question is going to come from Jim Roberts. Oh, my God. God! <laughs> All right, Colonel, you know what I'm going to ask you. When you arrived in Berchtesgaden, which is Hitler's home, and you looted the home, tell us about that story. Okay, when we got to Berchtesgaden, as I say, we were the first ones there. The guys would have taken off the wallpaper if they could remove it. The only thing I got I wanted went into the bar, and they had a bottle of cognac. <laughs> so it had... For the fewest use only, I said, well, I better take that home. I might need it. So sure enough, I did. And my son's 13th birthday was his bar mitzvah. And I figured it was a time to open that bottle. So we did. And we drank it all. <laughs> and I threw the bottle away. And somebody asked me about 40 years later, we went to Cor, Georgia at a reunion, he said, have you got that bottle? I said, oh, are you kidding me? I said, what the hell good is an empty bottle? So he said, that bottle will be worth $10,000 today. So that was the bottle of cognac, sir. Oh, incidentally, the distiller, shall I mention the name? Okay, no, no. Anyhow, they still came in and brought me a bottle of that sh cognac was identical to the bottle except the fact that it had not, they, they looked all over Europe and found a bottle. Came to my Virginia Beach home about two years ago and brought me a bottle, the same bottle that I gave away, plus a bottle that was made a uh, hundred year old cognac so I have that, and I gave it to both of my one, to one son, one to the other, for their sons of our mitzvah. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a, a couple of questions. And by the way, I've, if you ever get a chance to go to Birch's Garden, go up to the Eagle's Nest, you'll see the names of a lot of the guys carved into the uh, into the into uh, the wood. The, uh, Fireplace. The wall, yeah, yeah. Yep, they all carved their names in the fireplace. It's still there. Okay, a couple of questions. Here we go, right over here. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I just wanted to quickly ask you if you had watched uh, the HBO Band of Brothers series that I'm sure almost all of us in this room have watched multiple times, you and uh, what you thought about it. Band of Brothers series. Band of Brothers series. No, I would not watch it. I watched a couple of, of the series. It's filthy. Absolutely filthy. Now, I'm no angel. I chased as many women and drank as much whiskey as the rest of them. But I don't like filth. And we didn't talk that way. We knew all the words. Not every other sentence was a curse word, a filthy curse word. The, the series was even worse than the book. And as far as the series were concerned, as far as truth, 
Nothing is further from the truth, either the book nor the series, but it brought attention to World War II, to our soldiers. And it was a good story, but as far as fact, very little fact, very little fact. I hope that don't bust your balloon, sir. <laughs> okay. One thing we can count on is Ed Shames going to tell you the truth. That's it. Let's have another question. See any more? There you are. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Staff Sergeant Conti, Penn State. Uh, so a lot of us here are training to become officers, uh, and you coming from such a prestigious unit, uh, is, was you, were you ever faced with a moral dilemma? And during that moral dilemma, what type of uh, uh, decision making can you uh, kind of give insight for that Facing experience? Moral dilemma, trying to make a decision what was right and what was wrong. Did I make a? Did you, were you faced with a moral dilemma in deciding what was right and what was wrong in order to move on? I was, I was a perfectionist. Never reached it, but I was a perfectionist. My men, actually, they respected me, but they hated my guts. All the men hated me because one of the first things I told them when I took them over, that you're going to work like hell to do your job. You're going to know your job inside and out. You're going to know the job from the man that's next to you on your left, his job inside and out, and the man on your right. You're going to work day and night to know their jobs and know your job. I said, this way, you're going to keep yourself alive. I said, not only that, you're going to keep me alive, which is more important. <laughs> and I really tried my best to be the best soldier in the world. I was not a lot of better soldiers than I was by far, but I tried, and they knew it. And they loved me when they came home. They didn't love me while I was with them. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, it wasn't that, it, 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 it wasn't that good, believe me. Because I'm tired and I was waiting for that guy to quit. And I thought maybe he dropped dead, but he didn't do it. Thanks very much. As always, you're 